All right. Hello, everybody. Um, and welcome to the panel, panel discussion today on file remediation. My name is Rachel Oslin, and I am the production coordinator for NELS. And I'm really excited to be here today. So I'm going to be your moderator, obviously. Um, I just wanted to make some quick notes before we get the ball rolling. Um, so we're going to have 30 minutes. Um, to discuss some of the key developments and um, challenges in this area of file remediation. I will start with some guide and questions. I also have a list of questions in case people get uh, stuck on anything um, the, so we can keep the conversation going. That being said, you know, I'm just here to moderate. So if the panelists get into a really good conversation, they're just going to go for the glory. Um, I will also be giving a 10 minute and a five minute warning, just so you guys know that you're going to have to start wrapping up what you're talking about. Since we only have 30 minutes, um, there's going to be no Q&A &Q for, the, for the panel, but that's what the working session is for. So don't you fear. Um, yeah, that's it for the quick notes. Um, so before we dive into the actual questions and discussion, um, I would like uh, all the panelists to introduce themselves. And again, um, just for the sake of time, um, please just state your name and your organization and your institutional affiliations. Um, and if anyone wants to learn more about people, you can always see, chat them up on Slack or there's also the full bios on our website for accessibility publishing. So let's uh, start with the first introduction. Um, and we can start with uh, Bob. Good afternoon. I just wanted to check my time to make sure. At least it's afternoon here in Ontario. <clears throat> uh, good morning to those on the West Coast. Uh, my name is Bob Minery. I'm the uh, manager of Alternate Education Resources Ontario, which is Aero. And I'm uh, happy to be here. I, I, for those that don't know, I should let you know that uh, Arrow is responsible for alternate format production from K to post doctorate uh, within uh, the province of Ontario uh, for uh, publicly funded schools. We provide uh, large print, braille, uh, digital audio. Uh, we also provide accessible PDF, Kurzweil and Word. And I, th I think I've got all the mediums. I mentioned all the mediums. <laughs> if I've forgotten one, I'll add, oh, an accessible PDF as well. Okay, thanks, Bob. Um, now let's go to Adam. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Wilton. I'm the manager of the Provincial Resource Center for the Visually Impaired um, and the Accessible Resource Center of British Columbia in, you guessed it, British Columbia. Um, PRCVI does uh, hard copy alternate formats, so braille and enlarged print for students who are blind or visually impaired, and the Accessible Resource Center, or ARCBC, uh, does digital format production for all students with print disabilities K-12 to in uh, British Columbia, and I'm delighted to see that my friend and colleague Corey Playford is here with us, uh, K who manages K for BC, and Corey uh, takes care of Pretty well the rest <laughs> in, in terms of post-secondary. That's me. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Adam. And uh, let's go on to uh, Lee. Hi, I'm Lee Nash, the publisher of Invisible Publishing um, here in Ontario. And I've been making eBooks for well over a decade now by hand. So if it's fun to learn all the new stuff you can do with them. <laughs> Yeah, I love learning new stuff too. That's really exciting. Thank you, Lee. And now, last but definitely not least, we're going to talk to Nellie. Hi, I am Nellie McKesson. Um, I'm the founder of a company called Heteris, um, which focuses on creating automated book production tools for any publisher who wants to use them. Um, it's sort of an extension of all my work doing book production, both uh, manually and through automated workflows for various large and small publishers uh, throughout my career. Thank you so much. Alrighty, so thank you all the amazing panelists for being here. I'm really excited for this conversation to get going. So let's just dive in. I'm going to start with a question. 
um, and just open it up to the panelists. Um, the first question I'm going to start off with is what advances have been happening around file remediation? Um, that's a great question. Uh, I guess I can kick things off. Um, I am I'm a little worried that I'm gonna I'm gonna be a bit of a broken record here in this panel um, and harp on about how the best defense is a good offense. Um, I think there's been a lot of focus lately on um, people revamping their workflows to actually do uh, born accessible books, born accessible books rather than having to like do actual file remediation on their backlist titles, um, which I think is a great advancement <laughs> in the field. Um, the the cleaner that your ebook files are, the more standardized they are at the very beginning of the process, the easier it is to add new accessibility developments to those files as they are developed. So, you know, if like next year EPUB 4 is suddenly the standard, if you have very clean structured files um, that you started making even today, um, it'll be so much easier to convert those to the new standard once it comes out. I can um, jump yeah. in and echo that actually just a bit. Um, it's Adam speaking. Um, the the quality, the initial quality of the file available, like from a remediation perspective, um, we often try to work with files from publishers. Um, you know, publishers know their content. Um, they uh, they have you know the. They are, of course, intimately connected with kind of the, the entire process of, of bringing that file into being. Um, and the cleaner the file that we get from publishers in from an alt format production perspective, um, the, the more efficiently, effectively, um, we're able to create an, an alternate format from that, from whatever we receive from publishers. Um, you know, in 2021, we still cut the spines off of an inordinate number of books. To scan them, and uh, yeah, I know, I know, it, it's, but but the the reality is is that we don't often, and and you know we we we're grateful for what publishers are able to share with us, but often we don't receive something in a format that is that we can work with. Um, so just you know, Nelly, I couldn't agree more. The idea of starting, um, you know, with the with with accessibility in mind from the outset, um, even if the file is not all the way where it needs to be to meet the access requirements of the end user, at least the alternate format sector can kind of pick up the ball and run with it, um, rather than having to cut the spine off of the dead tree version, which we're still doing in 2021. Totally, I totally agree. Um, I also think, uh, there's a lot of development um, happening in the publishing ecosystem right now around tools that you can use both to create your books at the at the beginning and also to check your books. I know they mentioned the ACE um, accessibility checker in the last session, um, which is a great tool that you can use to just run your EPUBs through and it'll give you a list of things that you need to fix um, to make that book more accessible. Um, Going back to my previous point, <laughs> um, if your books are standardized, um, by which I mean you're using um, style names or tag names consistently for every paragraph, you're using the same types of elements in the HTML, and this might be getting more technical than, than most of you um, want to get into, um, but just standardizing that markup that's inside the EPUB um, will help you know that, you know, if the ACE checker is saying, I need to fix this one thing in one book, I know that all of my other books use exactly the same markup. And so I know that I need to change that same thing in all of my other books. Um, so it just makes your job a lot easier. I was gonna say, as a, as a publisher, the thing for me that's been really exciting is that this knowledge is more out there. Um, it's easier to access because a couple of years ago, I would have had no idea where to even look for information about making our books accessible. And that even just having that available for people to, you know, to, to Google or through associations, um, that's the thing that's made it easier for me in particular to pick up 
um, pick up the changes and make them um, part of it. You know, there's still some stuff I don't know and I'm learning, but I know where to go to learn. <laughs> What we've found, uh, and that's an excellent point, um, uh, but one of the other things that uh, Arrow has found, just to shift gears a bit, is that we've, um, we've been fortunate enough to uh, create uh, partnerships with publishers. Uh, we originally started with our post-secondary publishers. So uh, when a request was uh, made from a school into Arrow, it automatically went to the publishers and the publishers, because they knew that Arrow was a trusted uh, um, intermediary, um, provided us uh, the, you know, the file with which to work. And that works so well at the post-secondary level that now we have a stable of publishers. We have a set of 20 publishers totally who um, we have a contact where so when an advisor makes a request into arrow saying i need this particular title in this particular format and this is the publisher we have a contact and the publisher has a relationship with us where we're not trying to reestablish, you know all the criteria we're just saying we need this title and, and they have a comfort level to send it to, to to give it to us and for us to transcribe it and it and from an edge in the educational field because timeliness is as important as uh, you know um, accessibility, um, that's that's been a game changer for us. Is creating like relationships with publishers where, where they know that Arrow and in, and by extension Care, the Care members are are doing the work that's that's required. Should we be now? Should we be doing it? Is another question for another day. But the fact that we do do it and the fact that we have a real uh, a conduit for quick uh, quick result uh, has been a game changer for, at the K to twelve level. In addition to the post secondary, can I just add, um, Bob, to that that uh, CARE is the Canadian Association of Educational Resource Center of, for uh, alternate format materials, and so we're a, we're a network of essentially all of the K to twelve and post secondary producers at a provincial level um, for alternate format materials. So. Um, we're, we're working in coordination with one another so that if a, if a student in Halifax needs a, uh, uh, a let's say biology 12 in uh, braille format, uh, we, can, we can get that on loan and vice versa. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say, I loved Bob's point about having good partnerships also. I think that's really um, important. Um, you know, if you're working with a conversion vendor, um, or if you know people from the various W3C working groups, um, I think there are lots of people out there who will be happy to help you um, figure out what your path forward needs to be based on your own unique needs at your company. I have to say the NELS audits have been amazing the NELS audits of materials, that was a real sort of turning point for me was to have somebody walk through one of my EPUBs, point out all the things that were wrong with it, <laughs> and then give me a chance to go back and fix it and bring it back and have it audited again. And that was such a great opportunity. So the more of that can happen, um, at least to then come out with sort of like, now I have a standardized ebook that I can use for every project going forward, um, which a has cut my ebook production time down to like next to nothing, but it's also a template that I know is going to be accessible um, with relatively minor tweaking. Uh, yeah. So go Nels. <laughs> um, sorry. No, no, Rachel, it's okay. I was. <laughs> it's all good. I just wanted to ask you guys. Um, how, uh, how about, uh, dealing with the cost of remediation or the, rem oh my goodness, dealing with the cost of the remediation of files and titles. I can say it's a big barrier. <laughs> um, like it, it's a cost and time, right? Like those are the two things and, you know, we're, we're public as publishers, we're very short on both of those things. Um, there's a bunch of, of 
programs uh, happening right now that are making it more available for us to apply for funding to remediate those titles or have them done for us. And that's huge, especially for publishers with bigger backlists. Um, you know, it's, it's great to be able to hire interns periodically, but those aren't guaranteed nor are, and often if you get an intern one year, you don't get one the, the next year. So the continuity can be difficult there um, to, to support it. Um, you know, I've been chipping it away at it. I'm really hopeful that a bunch of our titles will go through this, <laughs> through one of the, the programs that are available right now, but um, it's a challenge. One of the, um, because we work in the educational sector, I'll give you an example of a title that we had to outsource uh, was the Canadian Income Tax Act annotated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you can imagine, uh, so while the, so it, it was an 800 page book full of tables that we had to make it accessible. Um, the cost was north of 40 grand. Uh, and, uh, and by north, I mean, uh, you know, Yukon north of 40 grand. Um, that's not unusual in the educational sector. If I, and, it's, uh, and that's, I think it's those type of titles that, that one keep arrow and PRCVI in business, but it's also, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a real problem. It, it, it's not so much the cost only, it's because there's very few houses and individuals that have the expertise in one medium, let alone for multiple mediums, the ability to um, train someone, like you, you couldn't expect a publisher to have that expertise in house, you know, or because that, the, the, that expertise may only be used once, you know, in a year. And likewise, it's a ch it's even a challenge from a um, like from from an educational uh, like a, like a resource center like our own, and, and like Adams and Adam, correct me if I'm saying something incorrect here, but it's having like the cost to to keep the skill sets current is a, is another cost associated with with um, transcription. Absolutely, Bob. These are highly specialized skill sets. Um, and not, not only are they highly specialized, but they're, they're continuing to evolve in an increasingly complex environment when you start adding in, um, you know, EPUB production and what is, you know, what is the interface, uh, or the involvement for EPUB production for, um, um, for, uh, let's say a Braille transcriber in terms of writing descriptions or producing a tactile supplement. Um, so no, absolutely. Uh, these are these are and these these costs I think play out differently across the education sector. Um, you know, in our province in British Columbia, we have two separate uh, agencies which are funded. Uh, you know, again, um, uh, uh, funded separately between um, post secondary and um, and the K to twelve sector. And I know that students in the post-secondary sector do face some specific cost pressures around uh, remediation. And I don't want to put you on the spot, Corey, but can you speak to that point just a little bit? That's funny. I was just looking for Corey too. Yeah, I was, <laughs> I was trying not to designate myself a panelist. So uh, yeah, I was just um, mentioning to Adam that I know in certain provinces, students in the post-secondary sector are expected to pay their own remediation costs. So if they ask their school for a file um, that's being farmed out to a third party to do and that students bearing that cost, which is just a, an inconceivable burden to me at the level of reading that students are expected to undertake in post-secondary. So I think if information like that makes its way to publishers, um, that's, that's uh, they probably don't hear that. So that's a really eye-opening, even to me working in this field, um, asking students to bear that cost is, is just unconscionable. So <laughs> off the panel. <laughs> Thanks, Corey. Uh, 
Um, something else related to cost that I will mention was something uh, is actually related to something that I, I brought up on the earlier panel is this notion of um, the baseline accessibility work that an alternate format producer would need to do versus some of the more specialized student specific work. And sometimes a challenge for us is a balancing both of those within our budget to, you know, in terms of, um, you know, ensuring that there's enough staff uh, time and resources to be able to produce, let's say, um, you know, uh, uh, a, a EPUB of a book that might be used by, you know, five or six students versus a, um, a really specialized title for a, a student who perhaps relies on non-visual access um, that may only be used by one student, but it's but that student has just as much right to to you know equitable and appealing access um, as any other learner. And so another piece of the yeah the costing puzzle for us is 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 managing the the you know managing those things that we're making accessible for a wider range of students versus those we know are going to be very isolated um, uh, use cases. And so the promise of born accessible in my my mind is that um, with a greater proportion of students with perceptual disabilities being able to use materials that are right out of the box um, from publishers, then the alternate format sector has more latitude to be able to focus on those access cases that are gonna require more advanced remediation. That's just, just gonna give the, uh, the 10 minute warning. Um, and I guess uh, another question we can go into is um, how are publishers dealing um, with the cost and time of remediating their backlists? I think I already spoke to that, hoping, hoping to get a grant. <laughs> oh, which is not a good answer. <laughs> I would argue it's the worst answer. Um, but it's, it's tricky to, I mean, we're, most publishers will ask if there's a business case for it too, right? And I think that it has to fall in, you know, that's such an ugly way to put these things when you're talking about access, frankly. Um, at the same time, we are businesses. And there are some people that are always going to take that line. And I think the best thing, I think getting people on board, to be honest, making accessible books going forward should be a, a priority. Um, and helping publishers triage the books in their backlist that, that would benefit most from remediation if there were some way to do that um, and to really take sort of a pronged approach would be, in my mind, the ideal way to come at it. That's sort of how we're, we've been working our way through our backlist too, but it'll be tricky for publishers with lots of titles, no matter how you slice or dice it. God, I feel like I'm all bad news. <laughs> I'm not, I, I feel mean, positive about this. I think everyone's quiet right now because the honest answer is like, there isn't really a great approach. Like it's just, it's gonna be hard if you have a lot of files in your backlist and like that came from a mixed number of sources. Like maybe you even have like frame maker files or like cork files or something. It's just gonna be hard and it's gonna take money and time and which is why I keep harping again on like it's never too late to start having like a a cleaner more streamlined workflow like what Lee was saying where she has this like templated EPUB now where she can just use that for every new title and it completely cuts down on her production costs and also kind of paves the way for her to be able to go back and add accessibility features in sort of a mass like broad way, either through scripting or some other faster way to add it that's not going to take all that time and money. Yeah, even find and replace is great for quick, <laughs> quick updates. <laughs> it's not. Um, one other thing, it actually, it occurs to me that maybe getting to that point where, uh, from a publisher's perspective, where you can actually then hand the file over to somebody who does need to take it further, like, there are steps we can be taking as publishers to even make our books even moderately more accessible. Um, you know, image descriptions are a huge one. They don't need to be, like I was actually shocked that we were told our image descriptions were good because I thought they were terrible. Um, but it turns out that, you know, I guess that's the bar, which is also terrible. 
um, that they're not good. But I think even just getting basic image descriptions into your eBooks, like pick something and do it, um, you know, rather than waiting until it's the perfect, <laughs> the perfect way to get it done. Not, not to be too tongue in cheek, Lee, but the fact that you had them was probably, <laughs> that was like, <laughs> oh, it's not good. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm all about baby steps. Mm -hmm. You can at least take baby steps. Yeah, I think yeah. that's great advice. So yeah, it kind of sounds like um, when it comes to like remediating, um, especially like backlist or when you have a lot of titles or like what was said before, like really complicated academic titles that are gonna take a lot of time, money and, and it's a very specialized skill that sometimes it's the best we can do. Um, uh, and then hopefully build on it in the future. Um, so I guess another question would be, um, when would it be necessary to remediate? All the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it's definitely something that's come up with us because we help a, a variety of different publishers. We have just sort of like standard like trade novel publishers, and then we have educational publishers on the other side. On the other side. Um, I think for educational publishing always is probably the answer like it, as, that it's so crucial to give every student access to all of the information that they need um, for trade publishing ideally always for sure but I think like there are there's sort of like a bare minimum of accessibility features that you can have in a novel that you can get away with I feel terrible saying this and like again it all comes back to the business case um, you know, as long as someone can read the book comfortably through whatever means they're, they're interacting with that text, um, I think that's good. So it's sort of, it comes down to what you're publishing um, and where you're trying to send it. I can, I can give you the policy language around this, this question, essentially, well, when 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 there when a mismatch continues to exist between the book and its the the work in its current format and the access requirements or profile of the user that and as long as that mismatch continues to exist there's a role for file there's a there's a place for file remediation and I know, uh, bob would you agree with that absolutely yeah yeah so so we and and this and again i'm Nellie, if, if, if you're a broken record, I am a shattered box of records somewhere in someone's basement right now, because I'm going to go back to something I said before, where it, the, the, um, the, the really specialized work that we do um, in the alt format sector, um, it's like, it, depending on the, the needs of the learner and the complexity of the material, I mean, that can be a really precise process. I mean, i just give you an example. Um, through ArcBC, we just produced a grade 11 math textbook that was, um, that was in um, accessible PDF and had a corresponding tactile supplement. Um, and so, but you see that, that was, for a specific user with a very unique profile. Um, and so I think that there's, um, I think that there's, there's, there's always likely going to be a need for some remediation, again, depending on the learner and the, and the, and their, their access requirements, but then to also, to also say that, um, you know, that work, I think it's important to make sure that we, that we as a community have that capacity at some level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. So we have three minutes left <laughs> um, in our, our last little three minutes. Um, this has been a really great discussion. Um, is there, does anyone have any closing thoughts about remediation and what we've been discussing that they'd like to add? I'd like to point out that since the symposium began, and this, uh, this is the third year, uh, I'm really encouraged that th we, we seem to be riding a wave rather than pushing a, a rock up a hill. Mm -hmm. You know, we know, we know we've, we've gone from slogging to surfing, 
right? Like the, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to find a metaphor that sounds fun. Like like the, it, 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 like the momentum, the momentum's on our side, recognizing that we hardly, we don't, we've hardly made inroads enough, but we now know that we that this is the way we need to go. And it, that's not even up to, that's not even a question anymore. And I applaud the publishers that are at the front of this that and that are making all the mistakes so that other publishers won't have to pay for those mistakes. That, that's not a small thing. And to add to that, I would further that, Bob, and say that um, we've come, we as a community have come a long way in terms of um, publishers understanding and appreciating the need for their materials to be um, to be produced accessibly. But not only that, to really embrace the the idea of of inclusive design, and that you know that that it's not just a matter of of asking stay asking users what they need and then going off and working on it somewhere in the background and then bringing it back to them and say oh hey is this kind of what you need oh no okay and then taking it back here that there's been much more of a kind of a co-design uh, you know uh approach where where publishers have been interested and engaged in centering the perspectives of users of, of print of uh readers with uh with print disabilities um, and so uh, as someone working in the alt format sector who is connecting with publishers and hearing more of like, and hearing publishers speak the language of accessibility more fluidly and more frequently, um, that's been really encouraging. That's awesome. Uh, Leonelli, do you have any closing thoughts? I guess my main closing thought is just saying the same thing I've been saying, um, invest in a good structured um, format for your EPUB files. Um, it's never too late to invest in that. It, I guarantee you a year from now, if you start today, you'll be so thankful that you did it. Um, so don't like, even if you have a huge backlist, of course, that's still a problem that you need to tackle, but you'll save yourself so many more file remediation issues um, if you start today. And um, Lee, do you have anything quick to say before we open it up to the working session? Books should be available to everybody. The business case <laughs> for books is that we want to sell more of them. Yay! <laughs> Yay! All righty. Thank you, panelists. Um, this has been a really excellent discussion. So I am just going to stop my recording. <laughs>